American-born Bolivian bombshell Raquel Welsh was sex goddess of the 60s. How come they call this place a tea house, my dear? Raquel Welch's very first movie was the 1964 Elvis film Roustabout, and as an Elvis fan, that was a huge deal for Raquel. Yes, Raquel has been a sex symbol for over 50 years, and I sat down with the icon who was born Joe Raquel Tejada, and who is now proving that her Latina sex appeal is still alive well into her 70s. I I'm Raquel. <laughs> yeah, I'm born with her, baby. <laughs> well, it's the Latin blood is a little hotter, it's true. You know, people would ask me, well, what kind of a name is Raquel? And at that time, I was Raquel Tejada. Mm. Of course, I didn't speak, say it like that with a Spanish accent, but or Raquel Tejada. And people were going, what kind of a name is that? And I would go, <laughs> and I'd go home and I'd say, what kind of name is that? And they'd say, oh, well, that's Spanish. That's a Spanish name. Oh, well, where, where is that? Where, where, where does that come from? Because I was little. Mm -hmm. So there was this kind of a mystery about not mystery, but this kind of confusion about where what I was really about. Do I call you Rocky? Somebody told me your friends call you Rocky. Yeah, people do. Where'd that come from? Me, well, when I was in school, people called me Rocky and. Uh, oh, even, Rocky Raquel, of course. Rocky Raccoon. I never thought no, of that. No, well, that was actually because most people I don't think could pronounce Raquel instead of Raquel because they yeah. all kinds of funny things, and so they call me Hey Rocky, Hey Rock, and stuff like that, and sometimes they call me Torchy or some. Don't you have a nickname? Sure, most yeah. most of them are on are on uh, court documents, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> which are sealed uh, no, you know, no, right but, now. No, but then later on, when I you know sort of nowadays, sometimes people call me R W or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> do you know they wanted me to run for president of the country when I was you should there? Do that. I, I thought, what heck am I, Evita? What's happening I'm gonna, to me? I'm going to start a whole thing with help for <laughs> no, president no, of Bolivia. No, I don't. No, 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 that's not for me at all. But <laughs> how fun that is. Did you always want to be a performer then? Oh, yes. I, I think you could say that since I was a little kid, about uh, five years old or something, yes. And how long was it before you went into Hollywood? Oh, gosh, you're asking me to go back so long. And um, let me see if I can remember. Um, I got married. I had two kids. <laughs> really? In that yeah. time? Oh, yeah. So how my early... Um, stardom was really built as a single mother who was struggling, you know, um, to raise my children and also to break into a very uh, difficult business. When I started out, a lot of people don't know this in Hollywood, I had two kids already and not a bean to my name or any connections or anything. 200 bucks in my pocket, I didn't know anybody, I had two kids, two little toddlers, and I had like $10 a week for food money. And uh, one of the first movies I did was... Um, a fantastic Voyage, you know. You know the scene in uh, Fantastic Voyage when you're wearing that tight outfit and all the little <laughs> antibodies stick on you like that? That's yes. a pivotal moment in my life, it that was. scene. It was a pivotal moment. Yeah, yeah. And, ah, fantastic. Yeah, and, and it was not a very big part, you know. And, um, <laughs> and it was uh, science fiction. And it, and it took like nine months to do this movie. So... While this movie was having all the special effects done, I, um, I went to London ah. to make another movie called uh, One Million Years B.C. Ah. Going, back, going back to your, to, to your start in, what, 64? Back in the movies? Um, yeah, I made uh, Fantastic Voyage in around 1964, 65. And then it took a year for it to be, to have the special effects finished on it. And, and done, you know, and released. And during the course of that year, while they were finishing up the special effects, I did One Million Years B.C., where I was this new by little queen of the shell people. And, um, well, I, I think it was really One Million Years B.C., and it was a kind of a, um, a twosome. It was One Million Years B.C. and another sci-fi classic called Fantastic Voyage, and neither one of them gave me anything to say much, you know, in... See, I thought movies were all, was all going to be Ginger Rogers and, and uh, Fred Astaire and Dan Daly and, and Betty Grable, and I was dancing. I was sort of started out to be a dancer when I was about eight years old, and I thought that, you know, what, if I ever got to be in in films or, or on the stage, that I, that's what I would like to do. But when I came along, that was not what was going on at all. People wanted to see realism, and they didn't really take to the idea that glamour was a good thing. It was, 
considered superficial plastic and all of this. Um, perhaps it is in a way, but I think it also has um, um, something to offer. Oh, I agree with you. Absolutely. <laughs> You've got a lot to offer. Oh, I walked into that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> no, but, uh, but, no, but um, no, in the nicest possible way, Amanda. But I mean, well, what was it? I mean, was it a difficult thing there to be, to be treated seriously? Oh, I mean, I'm thinking about the casting couch business in Hollywood. I mean, oh. Did you get chased around the table? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. That's kind of an X-rated item. <laughs> I do. Go on, tell me the truth. Um, <laughs> not really, no. There were a few times when people disappointed me a little bit, but it wasn't really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, help! Somebody help! <laughs> no, I, uh... Did I? Yes, I did. <laughs> I said what I thought I said. Um, no, it's not like the carpet baggers, which my mother had given me recently to read and said that is what Hollywood, what Hollywood is all about. It wasn't like that. Yeah. No, there's a few wolves, but there's wolves in, in any nightclub, discotheque, uh, uh, restaurant. Yeah. The other thing that I, I found out also is that um, I didn't really know my place once I did break in because I could see that they were only interested in me because I had a certain body and I had a pretty face and I had a look. And uh, and that was, uh, you know, it was good that, you know, that was there because otherwise I would never have done one yeah. million years BC. And no. <laughs> if you had looked like the late Elsa Maxwell, it might have been different. <laughs> but Elsa but Maxwell. by the same token, I didn't know once I you know once I made it yeah. into the public eye and the, the you know the main arena, I didn't know well, what am, what am I going to do now? I mean, you know, I don't I'm so green. I don't really know that much about filmmaking. I don't. I can see that the technique in front of the camera is very much different than what I had done, you know, when I was, uh, you know, when I was doing my children's theater and my my um, my studies of theater arts in school. It was so different. So that I has to like be scary when you go into the studio and these are experienced film actors, yeah. and you're not sure what to do. Is that? Yes, it is. It is very scary. We asked what that taught her. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I thought, well, nobody gets any help in this business. That was the only eye-opener. I thought, you've really got to do it all for yourself. I mean, where are the golden days? I mean, I thought people were going to take care of you, even if you had this sort of dippy little part that they'd sort of at least sort of direct you and sort of doll you up and help you a little bit. But I can see now that it's, uh, you know, loving hands at home. You better know what you're doing because nobody's going to help you. Raquel attained undeniable superstar status with this, the provocative movie One Million Years B.C. That killer body and mane of auburn hair made her a worldwide sensation. Let's take a little peek back at this one-of-a-kind career. The year was 1966 when a 26-year-old Raquel Welch appeared in a doe-skin bikini for the movie One Million B.C. Dick called me on the phone, Dick Sanic, and he said to me that he'd like me to be in um, a movie called One Million Years B.C. Michael Carreras found an interesting mix of fantasy and flesh. I was called on the telephone by Dick Zanuck, who was head of the studio then. He said, we've got this fabulous project for you, Raquel. It's called One Million Years B.C., and it's a remake of a Victor Mature Carol Landis movie. And I said, oh my God, not a dinosaur movie. I realized that it was a dinosaur movie. And I called him back and I said, I don't want to make a dinosaur movie. He said, but you have no choice in the matter, dear. You're under contract here, so you'll go. That the public first discovered the curvaceous Raquel, the film was one million B.C. She uttered only three phrases in the entire film. Oh. Raquel was scantily clad in the 1966 movie One Million Years B.C., and that's when the world really took notice of the then 26-year-old. A young Latina actress of Bolivian descent also gained international stardom in a popular British production. One Million Years B.C. was the breakthrough film for me. Yeah, we have some, uh, <laughs> some pictures We're here. We're going to walk down memory really... Was this your first movie, One Million B.C.? Actually, I, I think it was my second movie, but probably the thing that made it possible for me to continue. Now, this... <laughs> 
but the woman she wanted to be has been a struggle. Raquel's sex symbol image was sealed with the release of the film One Million Years B.C. And previous to that, also, which was a Fox release, was Fantastic Voyage, and I thought, I'm caught in sci-fi hell. I mean, first of all, I'm swimming through the human bloodstream at microscopic size, and now I've got to fight off dinosaurs. And basically, for me, it was a dinosaur movie, and I thought, oh, God, i got to go from microscopic size, and now I'm going to be chased by dinosaurs? I mean, I mean what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Well, after moving on to films and uh, more walk-ons, I finally landed my first speaking part, and it was then that I uttered those immortal words, Er, Luana, Uncle Tumac. Me, Luana, you, Tumac. <laughs> that was like my big, my big moment, you know. And I kept thinking, oh, if they make me do one more silly thing, if I have another line like, me, Luana, you, Tumac, I think I'll just never be able to show my face again. I said, me, Luana, you, Tumac. That's what I said in the whole movie. Uh-huh. Luana? No, she didn't need to say a lot. Back in the 60s, every man in America got the point when she burst onto the screen in that doe-skin bikini in one million years B.C. In 1965, Raquel was approached to star in a remake of a classic 1940 caveman and dinosaur movie called One Million Years B.C. I really didn't want to be in a dinosaur movie. I just felt like, oh, I'm, you know... My career is never going to lift off if I do stuff like this. Let's just say Raquel would make a lousy fortune teller. Appearing in a torn leather and doe skin two-piece that barely contained her bountiful bosom, Raquel's character Loana became an instant classic. I sort of came on the scene, you know, with my cantilevered brassiere, and it was, <laughs> you know, stardom overnight. And this rocketed me to stardom. <laughs> Who knew? You know? So there I was in the Canary Islands, parading around in this little loinskin bikini, and um, it sure worked. It did, certainly yeah. did. What was your, what was your, I'm Luana, you Tarmac, or something like that? Was yeah. that the great my, line, my, memorable line from that movie? I was, uh, I played the part of Luana. She was, yes, in fact, a, a nubile beauty. And when I made that movie, then everything happened for me, and I, you know. You know, I think to have a dream, Mm -hmm. at all is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Even if it doesn't materialize, mm -hmm. it's a great thing that you have an enthusiasm for something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when you get your wish, it's not exactly what you thought it was going to be anyway. Right. So <laughs> there's a little bit of disillusionment there. Uh, it does not necessarily about drive and fortitude. It's not necessarily. Because it just, it just happens, and you don't know where or when, and sometimes in the most unusual ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't think I would ever be uh, sex symbol and be up on the Canary Islands in some volcano and, and end up, a, that would be ev how everybody thought of me in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And of course, and I, of course, I wanted to break into the movies, and that was my w dream come true, right? But then, of course, it had some other downsides to it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, uh, but you it, didn't give up? Oh, no, I didn't give up. Um, that was too good a ticket to ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, but it, I just think, good to have dreams. Kind of, I dreamed that it would happen. I just said, oh, gee, this is great. But I really wasn't sure whether it was going to go anyplace. But it was just because I think I was raised in Southern California, and it seemed like second nature to me so because it was a beach community. Yeah. So I thought, oh, well, this is not anything like racy or really, you know. It had a different connotation. For me. Yeah. Because I had where you grew up. Yeah, because but then I had no idea. People really hadn't been seen that much in this you know, very open bikini bare midriff thing mm -hmm. at, at that time, you know. And so I uh, got created this big stir when they saw me in One Million Years BC, and I had oh, you well, know, I was not it prepared. It was stirring, for it. especially for the fellows up <laughs> here. <laughs> what a getup! Wearing mankind's first fur bikini. They gave me this little tiny costume, and I just thought, oh my God, you know, <laughs> this is like. I, I, there's no way I can turn that something isn't, you know, kind of showing. So it was like, really. It made you nervous. Um, but I thought, well, you know, fine. I'm going off to the Canary Islands. Nobody will ever hear about this. The next issue of Time Magazine came out. And when I got it on my doorstep, it had the whole issue was about swinging London and how everything was happening in London. And there was this whole 
Cultural Revolution, Carnaby Street and all this, and I thought, well, that can't be too bad. You know, I'll go to London, I'll do this turkey, and then everybody will forget about it, and I'll have myself a great time. <laughs> So I sort of happily got on the plane, you know, and to, to go to, to London and to shoot in the Canary Islands, which is far removed from the streets of London. And when she got there, Raquel had more second thought. And when you look back at that bathing suit, that fur oh, thing you know, that you were I'm, wearing. I, you know, I, I'm sort of partly intimidated by it and partly I'm so glad I'm not her anymore. It was just so uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, you were in oh, that yeah. sarong kind of outfit. Well, yeah, it was it was a bikini, really, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Well, it was it was meant to look like a, a, a cave girl thing that has sort yeah. of been ripped away by elements and, you know, sort of nature and well, raw you took sexuality. Of what came you wait? Sexuality can give you a certain power. This bathing suit certainly says power. It says I went out and I killed an animal and now I'm wearing it. Because I did revisit. I did watch uh, One Million Years BC uh, just the other oh. night. Oh dear. And um, oh, I had to ask you. Ancient. Did history. you get? Did, did you get to uh, keep the deerskin bikini? Have you still? I, I hate to ask. Have you still got that uh, fur bikini? Um, actually, I do. Really? Yes, I do. Hey, Raquel, Charlie was hoping you'd wear the uh, bikini today. Do you have it in your purse? <laughs> Did you bring it? Will there be a change so later? Actually, you know she's jesting of, here. It's, it's sort of this really. is a woman whose fantasy goes way wide. <laughs> well, Charlie, what uh, what's happened with that costume? Of course, costume? mine does, too. Oh, dear. <laughs> yes. That costume, uh, just for an FYI, yes. is actually sort of in the wings at the Smithsonian, waiting yeah. to be hung. Where it should you be. You still have the fur bikini, surely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Every summer, man, I'm out there on the beach in the same gear, you know, going, you Luana, me too, Mac. You know. The deer skin? The doe skin bikini was what they doe called skin. it. Doe skin, I'm sorry. But it's, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, but but I, I, have, I have one version of it, because there, there was a double, because the one that would get wet in the water would sometimes stretch out and it would have to go back up again, so I, we had more than one. Yeah, I have one of them. Yes, I do have one of them. <laughs> that is fantastic. The entire time I was watching, I was like, did she get to keep that? Looks great. <laughs> well, I, I still do have it. I don't try it on anymore, though. Wait, you can't do it for movie night when we come over? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're terrible. You're a horrible I'll human. I'll put on one of my old costumes from one, of my, nice guy. from one of my uh, past gigs. a creepoid. Okay, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Tom's really made the most of this little doe skin number that I was supposed to wear. So uh, this costume got smaller and smaller as the production went on. And I felt a little self-conscious with this very brief thing on all the time. Alternately, I would try to sort of strut my stuff to make the most of it because I figured, obviously, this is why they'd cast me in this movie, not for my acting ability because I have no lines. In a loincloth, this is how we came to recognize Raquel in the movie about prehistoric times. What was that movie? Does anybody know? One million BC, you got it! Oh. A home version of our show for that lady in green. Uh, Wait, are you, you know, talking I, about like the Linda Carter Wonder Woman? There's a new one. No, you know, you know, because I did the One Million Years BC uh, movie with this tiny little costume and everything, I didn't have Wonder Woman's powers, but apparently I had some kind of... You uh, had some powers, though. I did have you some powers. You definitely had powers. And when I came away from that, you know, <laughs> that just rocketed me into international, you know, people knew who I was. I don't want to say that I was a star at that time, but it was like suddenly everybody was focused on me, and it was a little uncomfortable, but I, I'm very grateful for that. So I felt like I've done my little tiny costume And now I can't stop life. thinking of you as Wonder Woman. I, I'm like, Linda Carter's gone. I just now have you in No, in no, that, no, in no, no. I don't, little want, stars I don't and want those outfit. last few things, you know. The gold, the cuffs, though? That's, the you like gold that, cuffs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's great, it's great. <laughs> Wouldn't that be an... Well, all, Halloween. You know, this interview, I can't stop thinking we about this interview Halloween. now, because all I can think about is, is, uh, is you being the president of Bolivia as Wonder Woman. <laughs> She's been a star since one million years B.C. Of course, we're referring to the 1966 film by that name, in which she made history as the world's most gorgeous cave woman. Okay, here we go again with the... One million years, years B.C. B.C. How'd you know we would go to that? <laughs> I don't know, just a guess. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll guess at that. But yeah. that is what people first remember you yes, for. Yes, of course. Her, her meteoric rise began in the 1960s in the film One Million Years B.C. 
And then Raquel's big break came in 1966 when she was cast in a lead role as a curvy cave girl in prehistoric adventure one million years BC. She emerged from the ocean in one million years BC in that very, very skimpy bikini. And from that day forward, her career was made. Raquel Welch she appeared in that now iconic loincloth bikini. Designed to showcase her undeniably impressive assets. Here's Raquel making her Ursula Andress entrance. She was quite sensational. Raquel Welch was really Raquel Tejada from San Diego. And this picture introduced her to the world big time. One million years BC erupts on the screen with volcanic excitement. One million years BC, when the earth parted and the mountains fell. Since time began, has the primitive scene been captured for the screen with such imaginative realism? In one million years BC. <laughs> Introducing the fabulous Raquel Welch, the sensational star discovery of this or any other year in one million years BC. See her as Loana the Fair One, who deserted her tribe and risked her life to follow Tumac of the Rock People. Introducing the fabulous Raquel Welch as Loana the Fair One. How much of your life changed after you did One Million Years BC? Oh my gosh, I just was there doing this dinosaur movie. In one fell swoop, everything in my life changed and everything about the real me was swept away. When I did One Million Years BC and that poster came out that everybody fixated on. That when I was doing One Million Years BC and the famous poster and that movie that has become actually a classic. But when I came to Hollywood, it was just, you know, I was actually was the mother of two small children. And down at the bottom in the hotel are my two kids, you know, with mm -hmm. the nanny. When you saw the poster of One Million Years BC, it was really a mother of two. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm on the top of this volcanic, you know, mountain in the middle of, of, of you know, Tenerife in the Canary Islands. I'm up on this volcano in the Canary Islands shooting this caveman epic. And really, down at the hotel are two little kids, Tani and Damon, one in diapers and one in a stroller. So I was like a young mommy, and nobody knew that. Yeah. You know, so to me, it was totally surreal was that all this was happening. Release. No, but, you know, a lot of people have always said when I told that story that I'm disillusioning all those guys. When you were in that movie wearing that bikini, that yeah. little thing, that you were the mother of two children, and I think <laughs> the powers that were at the time didn't want us to know that because that would ruin the whole sexy image thing, right? Um, you know, it, it wasn't common knowledge. It was not something that I paraded around a lot because when I first came to Hollywood, it was really clear that no actresses really had children. Right. And uh, I had my first baby when I was 19. 19, because you married your high school sweetheart. Yeah, yes. all of that. And so I, I didn't really know which path my career would take, Oprah. And, and then when it turned out that they really liked me because of the body and because of this, you know, sultriness and all of that. Not that I wasn't really happy for the break. And so here I was um, hoping to break in because I didn't know how much longer I could drag my kids around the crazy you know, life I was living um, as, a, a, as a struggling actress. But getting settled there would not be easy. Nobody wanted to rent to a young woman with two kids, and it made you feel so bad. You felt like, oh, it's really not okay to have kids, and it's really not okay to be a single mother. And to have to go and get somebody to take care of my children, to always have that gnawing at me, that, that sense of guilt and that feeling like, you know, here I am, and I hope they're going to see me soon because I have to get back. It really puts you in this very vulnerable position. And I thought, boy, I really don't want to be hanging around here waiting for a break forever. I'm going to give it three years and really, really try. And I was like praying. 
please God, I mean, let me break through this pretty quick because I don't think I can stand much more of this. Right. So you're happy about, I was happy that I got a break mm -hmm. so I could have my career and... And, um, but, but by the same token, I, I really, um, it was not something I wanted necessarily to be. I found it flattering mm -hmm. and I found it very, very lucky and fortuitous. But I also felt like, wow, they, it's all about that, the way I look. What and about I what's have, in here? Do you care about what's in here? Did you well, ever? Yeah, but how do you live up to that? They keep saying these amazing, crazy things like you just said about me, like I'm the second coming or something. You know, I'm so beautiful. I'm you so are. Gorgeous. And it's like, come on. So now, you know, so after that, you know, every morning you'd wake up and you go, oh. No, but so, okay, so seriously, do you house? feel? I mean, it was so schizophrenic. I mean, I knew I wasn't her, you know, the lady in the doe skin bikini. <laughs> right. Yeah, but at the same time, everybody else thought that I was her. And so it was, uh, it was it's an interesting, you know, experience. What did that feel like, being every man's fantasy? Well, part of it was really flattering and fun. I was going to say, hey, that's got to you know, be fun. It was kind of really cool. And the other part was just really scary as hell. Really? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, it was like, I mean, they're saying I'm that. Well, I can't, I can't live up to that. Did you like it? Did you like being a symbol? Did you like being a film star? Um, I liked the... Um, I guess you could say I liked the attention, to be honest. And I liked the chance it gave me. But I couldn't say that I really enjoyed it. I, I was really much too self-conscious. I think looking back on it, I'd have to say that I was very intimidated by really, yeah, my own image. And I was always scared of her, the girl from One Million Years BC. I was scared I couldn't live, live the image down, that it would get in my way to really develop as an actress. I was afraid I couldn't live up to it. I would look at this poster and all these pictures and I'd say, well, who is that? You know, how can I live up to that? I just hard. But, you know, it is actually, I mean, it's 30 years ago, folks, so we could, you know. You may I'll never live this one down. I figured, well, Steve McQueen got away with the blob. You know, maybe I can get away with one million years B.C. You know, nobody will remember this thing. I can shove it under the carpet, you know. But, uh... That sex symbol thing is just the worst possible mantle to wear because everybody has something, you know, to, to tease you about. You're unintelligent and you can't act and you're, you know, you're going to disappear overnight. The world took notice when she appeared as a scantily clad prehistoric woman in one million years B.C. I figured, well, Steve McQueen got away with the blob. You know, maybe I can get away with one million years B.C. You know, nobody will remember this thing. I can shove it under the carpet, you know? But, uh... People remembered it. <laughs> I've been living it down ever since. Most films capitalized on her beauty and overlooked her talent. It was almost, I didn't have a choice in the matter. I would have to take the things that this particular beginning spawned and make the best out of it. I have an overall glamorous kind of an image, and I have certainly, you know, sort of uh, emphasized that about my personal self. Um, that it kind of eclipses some of the work I've done as an actress. And um, it's a kind of um, a thing that has been traditional uh, through movie history, that if you have an attractive young actress, that you do sort of tend to exploit that aspect of her physicality more than you exploit her talent in many ways, because you're considered just a glamour symbol. But, you know, I'm not complaining. But do you think Hollywood was tough on you? Were, there, were those tough times where it must have been frustrating, I think, to have your own thought process, be a three-dimensional person emotionally yes. and, and, and with yes. your intelligence, and then all of a sudden it's just, well, yeah. just beauty, 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 beauty. Yeah, yeah, it, it was uh, me as, a, as an object kind of a thing. All the Rock Howell cha-cha-cha stuff, you know, with the sex symbol nonsense that went on and on. And but that really wasn't who you were, was it? No, it's not who I was, but I could play her. Yeah. And look, I, I, <laughs> I'm still playing her. And you know, I could play her pretty well because I tried to imbue her with a lot of things in, 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 without being able to really have a lot of clever dialogue, which is not easy to do. I was probably kidding myself. You this know, is interesting. Probably, so you, when you but say I, I play to... her, the expectation people had of you, yes. you made sure you stayed within that so they yeah. wouldn't be disappointed. Uh, yeah, I was kind of trying wow. to play somebody kind of independent and a little bit athletic and kind of, you know, kick ass and take no prisoners. Can you say that? 
Yes. Yeah, well, that was kind of a little more rough and ready. It was more kind of athletic. It was um, the 60s, and so there was a lot of upheaval and change. So I think that, you know, I'm almost 70 years old. I, I'm so sick of saying my age, but it does make <laughs> me look better. Um, uh, I just, I, I thought that I had something to say, and I thought, you know, Raquel, they're still hawking this damn fur bikini. Can I say D-A-M-N? Yeah. Uh, well, you and just it's, did. It, yeah. Uh, and and I just you know there there's another there is a me there is an authentic Raquel who has nothing to do with that fur thing and the dinosaurs or any of the rest of the movies or any of the rest of the bikini shots and I just felt that it was mm -hmm. time to let her out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> the image that I've had, which was an inanimate object mm -hmm. and a symbol, a thing. And that person, that Raquel Welch sex symbol lady, whoever she is, she didn't have a voice. And coming up to 70, I thought, you know, I don't want to wait too long before I say, you know, some things that I'm thinking and knowing about and experienced. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to, I want to go ahead and tell what I know, you know, and what happened for real. Mm. Because otherwise, this thing is just going to perpetuate along until sure. I'm 90. Because my mom lived to 93, and if I'm going to still have to live down the cave girl thing, <laughs> the fur bikini at 93 is going to be really That's rough. That's really you know. I felt like when I came along in that poster, I was a thing to be seen and not heard. Yes, yes. And, you know, by the time you get to 70, you might have a couple of things you'd like to say. You, you speak briefly about this and beyond the cleavage you're talking about. At the time, everybody was, you know, gaga over Marilyn Monroe and that yeah. whole Marilyn blonde image. Yes, exactly. That yes. was right before me. Yeah. Yes, before you. Yeah. Stimulating sexual desires was not interesting to me. I would never have ended up being a sex symbol. And then you came along. At the time, people were like, uh. Eh, not blonde enough, right? And that was the first time that somebody said to me, you have to dye your hair blonde. And I was like shocked. Ooh, da la. I was like, what? <laughs> what? What is this? I said, why do I have to be blonde? They said, because you're queen of the shell people. <laughs> you are the good girl, you know. It, the, only the bad girl has dark hair. So I went, ooh, that's not nice. <laughs> but um, I did it. Oh, you know, Rita wasn't that good looking until they changed her hair. And then I went into the books and I would look and see Rita when she was really super young, just a teenager with a dark, dark hair. And she was gorgeous. I mean, she was every bit as gorgeous. She was just different. She looked more ethnic. Well, when I tried to do some modeling when I first came to L.A. and needed just to get a job, not even yes. break in yet, yeah, they thought I was, they hated my body. Everything was wrong, too much here, too much here, too little here, it was, you know. Can you imagine? Yeah, really. I... <laughs> the guy that turned down Raquel Welch is now, you know, in an institution somewhere. Do you feel as good as you look? I do, actually. Really? I do, yeah, because the older I've gotten, the more comfortable I've gotten in my skin. Uh -huh. Really, honest, honestly, that is absolutely true. I don't know why. Youth is so painful in so many ways. Emotionally, I always felt very you know, out of sorts and ill at ease, and I, and I was, I felt like, well, you don't know a damn thing about what you're doing, so fake it. Right, right. And while I was faking it, I was in a lot of pain. Right. For the real me. You know, a moment of silence sometimes is the most scary thing in the world. You know, you don't really want to open the door to your, you know, your heart, soul, and what's going on inside. And well, see, I'm the opposite. I love being with my thoughts and sitting with myself. And Well, I, I do now, but yeah. I had to get over that yeah. hump. That's beauty for you, Raquel, being a huge plus in your life, or has it been predominantly a huge curse? Um, you know, it's been an advantage, I have to say, because if it hadn't been that the studio, when I first came to Hollywood, saw me in a certain way, which was not the way I thought they had seen me, mm. but it was all about my look. Sheer beauty alone perhaps isn't enough, but of lots of times it gives a great deal of joy to many people, and I don't see why it should be perceived as some kind of disadvantage. I think it's, it's great. Beauty has been Raquel Welch's trademark for years. A long time ago when I first started out my career and I was in One Million Years BC, people kept saying, why don't you do a beauty book or do, give us your beauty tips and things like that. And I always felt kind of silly because I didn't have 
any, any answers for any of their questions. But now, at this point in my life, I have some of the answers. I had one beauty contest, like, in my hometown. Right. Well, Miss La Jolla, Miss San Diego, and then even, you know, Miss California at one point. But, you know, I thought, oh, well, it's just, you know, when you're a small-town beauty contest winner, that's one thing. When, you, when you're in Hollywood, mm. the standard is so much higher, you're just not going to be able to get arrested. So I never, ever thought about that, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I'm passable, but I, I have... I have talent, and I'm going to prove it. You know, well, they didn't give a damn about my talent. They so didn't care. You know? Well, what's that, that great uh, story mm -hmm. with? Um, uh, oh my God, it was a director that I actually worked with too. I think I have it in my in my notes. Uh, Don Chaffee. Oh, you worked with him? I did. I did a movie with Kidding. him too. Oh, uh, yeah, it was Don Chaffee on One Million Years BC, and I was trying to sort of make the most of it. Yes. You know? If it was just going to be the, yeah. you know, me in the cave girl outfit, at least let me try to do my best. Um, I was trying to embellish my part with some kind of ideas about, you know, little subtleties, but it, it, it never turned out that way, and um, probably better off because I was pretty green, and I'm not sure my ideas would have worked anyway. I have these fond memories of rushing over and, and talking to the director and saying, Hey, Don, I've been thinking, I've been looking at the, at the script, and I've been thinking, and he said, don't. Then I've got this idea, he said, yeah, I said, and I've been thinking, uh -huh. and he said, don't. <laughs> please do not think. And he'd say, please, darling, I don't want to hear any ideas. <laughs> you see that rock over there? That is rock A. Over here is rock B. When I call action, you run from rock A to rock B. When you get in the middle, you envision a giant turtle coming over the hill. And you go, you scream. Ah! <laughs> And we break for lunch. Got lovely. it? Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, that was What it. did you say to him? Or did you just like shut your trap and go, oh, okay, this is going to yeah, be interesting? Yeah, I, I, I was so livid because <laughs> I had a few things, choice words, and I thought, maybe not. It's amazing. Maybe not. Isn't it okay. amazing? And now you have a voice. <clears throat> and so he was just the first in a long line of directors and producers who didn't give a rat's ass what I thought. Really? No, they... No. So did you feel powerful, or did you feel that you were also sort of being manipulated and controlled? I felt I was being manipulated, and things were moving without my consent. Mm -hmm. But I was also trying to calculate, because I'm not stupid, mm -hmm. um, maybe this has a good side to it, yeah. and I better, you know, go with it and see where it leads me. Obviously, you are... Uh, a sex and beauty icon in the world. Used to be. Yeah. No, still are. Still are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely still are. And I'm always, I'm always fascinated by extraordinarily beautiful women. What that does to your psyche when you walk into a room yeah. and the room stops because you enter. You know, I have a good personality, but the room doesn't stop. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you are the sex symbol, and you have been, you know, marketed that way, and that is who the world thinks and you I've are. And I cooperated yes, with it. Yes, yes, and you've cooperated. And egged it on. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yes. And so what does that do to your psyche? Do you feel that you are that person, or you, or... Well, I'll tell you what. It's not that you feel that you are that person. I don't, anyway. No. I really do not, you, but... You didn't. No, I, I really didn't feel I was that person, but I was addicted to the kind of attention and reception uh -huh. that it got for me, the opportunities, the doors it opened. Yeah. So that part I, I became addicted to, and it pulled me away from my more serious artistic side, and I kind of just let the other go, to tell you the truth. Really? I did. I had to sort of, bye. To that you know, side. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Because this is what people will pay, this is what people pay to see. Uh -huh. And I did a couple of very serious roles, honestly. Uh, 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 and, and nobody showed up, you know. They was like, who cares? Because we want to see you look like Raquel, be Raquel. Th that's yeah. it. You know, it's the old-fashioned movie star thing, you know. No one wanted to see Marilyn Monroe do dishwater, you know, No, they us. want to see Marilyn Monroe look like Marilyn Monroe. That's want to see you thing. look like Raquel. Well, that's beautiful, though. I mean, that can also be a hazard. Because like when you first started, everybody says, oh, she's stunning, she's glamorous, and so <laughs> forth. And they tend to put you in that, in that mold, uh, you know, and don't look at the, any acting ability. Well, Just that's a, kind of true, you yeah. know. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, there's a, like a lot of things that can go wrong if you're, you know, considered a glamour puss or a sex yeah. symbol and all that. I mean, you know, it's like you can never live it down. I mean, it was taking me this long to get rid of one million years B.C. You know, I can't think. I can't wait. To, when that plays on cable, I'm right there. I'll be honest with you. That may be chauvinistic. It may be a, 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 a horny elderly man. But I, I watch that picture. You know, people. I'm still... a big. I love prehistoric animals. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, there, were, there weren't any men around you. There weren't any people around, you know, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Most people don't know I that. I was. Uh... Well, no, but I mean, <laughs> people always think that there were humans around when the dinosaurs weren't here, and they weren't here. And they weren't there. No, no, no but Luana and Tumac were. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's right, Luana and yeah. Tumac. No, but you know, I... <laughs> One Million Years B.C. has been on The Late Show so many times. It's been on... Everyone's seen One Million Years B.C. The poster's still around in all the head shops and stuff. I gotta tell you this, that uh, Friday, when I got the call... Right. ...to come down here to your show, I was watching One Million B.C. <laughs> Is that true? That's true, yeah. What a coincidence. You've never saw the end of it? No. Oh, what's the ending? Uh, the, uh, uh, you walk off, you walk off, don't, don't you, with Tamuk? Yeah, I, I think Tamuk, Tamuk and I, uh, well, that's not his name, Tumac. Tumac. Tum Tumac and I go off in the sunset together. God help us. I don't know. Yeah. Well, what a coincidence. One oh, million God. BC and you were sought. I know that's a long time ago, but I have to tell you that is a huge cult film over here, you know. Yeah, well, it remains, it should remain in a cult. It should never, ever, <laughs> it should just never, ever be shown, you know, on primetime TV, ever. I mean, it's the biggest piece of nonsense that ever hit the airwaves. But honestly, it, it did give me uh, my start, and, and so I've always been grateful for that. And, uh, and so it did put me on the scene, but it did put me on the scene in such a um, huge way. It, it was so celebrated that I was also very green, Tavis, and so I felt like, oh gosh, you know, so much attention, and I, I'm, you know, I'm not really getting, haven't got my feet wet yet, mm -hmm. I haven't really gotten my legs, uh, I don't, I'm not sure yet, you know, that I've developed, so I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about this. And of course, then, there's a usual uh, sex symbol thing that happens afterwards, and I mean, it's such a cliche, it's not even worth going yeah. into. For what it was, it, it did extremely well. It was a big hit movie. And God knows it put me on the map. So I'm, I'm very grateful that I did it, that silly dinosaur movie all those years ago. <laughs> I should have just relaxed and enjoyed it. It was a great time in lots of ways. One million years BC caused a worldwide sensation. And the New York Times proclaimed Raquel a marvelous breathing monument to womankind. For the kind of films that Hammer makes, I thought that they always do a, a very good job. They have a certain budget. They have a certain look they're trying to achieve. It's, it's not Gone with the Wind. It's not a David Lean movie, relatively speaking. I thought it was a pretty well done movie. It started me off. So, I guess Dick Zanuck was right, you know? <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen it in years. I mean, every once in a while on The Late Show, I sort of pass it and go, oh, there she is again. Just won't go away, that lady. One million years BC, that, that was on last night, right? Yeah. And so sometimes I see this on HBO, and uh, sometimes I stop and watch it, and sometimes, oh, pieces of it, I can't see through the whole thing, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sometimes I, I don't. But in, on one particular occasion, I was watching, and uh, something struck me, and I went, oh, come on. And people were going to watch this over and over and over again. Oh, why didn't they, you know, why couldn't they make me do that again? Why couldn't they say, okay, never mind, watch. But here was the thing. I had studied like 10 years of classical ballet, and it had just gotten into my whole personality, the ballet thing. So I, I wanted to be very physical in this movie because that's what she's, you know, really in survival. Um, in prehistoric times, so she'd have to be very, you know, uh, good at uh, getting along in, you know, just with bare bones, just the bare necessities. So I'm there and I'm fishing. Toma. So I've got the spear in my hand, I'm meant to be fishing. And I have to throw the spear at the fish and bring up the fish. So instead of just throwing the spear at the fish, I do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
shot at all these scenes on the top of Tenerife and Lanzarote Islands, in the Canary Islands. And you had to drive from a pensione all the way out to where it was just lava rock, no telephone poles or anything. Oh my gosh, I just was there doing this dinosaur movie in the Canary Islands, up on a volcano, Tenerife. It was snowing, and I am wearing this little torn away, well, it wasn't even fur, it was chamois, chamois. with a few fur bits left on it. And it was snowing, it was freezing, freezing cold. And I got the worst case of tonsillitis, and I almost died from it. I was frozen, frozen solid. And they used to have a little bucket of cold underneath the camera to keep the cameras turning to warm them up. But I was out there with hardly anything on. I was freezing to death through half the movie, I have to tell you. In fact, uh, I, I, uh, I had to have my tonsils removed when I came back from, from shooting because I had gotten such a severe case of tonsillitis because it was so cold out there. And the crew had fires and stuff burning underneath the cameras to keep the mechanisms from freezing. And I was out there and there's nothing. <laughs> The I don't know, three, four o'clock in the morning. When you were doing it, it, it just seems so ridiculously silly. A flying reptile. That was already back in the studio, so that was like not as difficult as the things that we did exterior for me. It was just hanging by, I guess they called them Foley wires then. And uh, they would just attach, you know, these talons, which were totally fake and rubber. I was thrashed about. I was sort of, ha, ah, ah, ha, you know, that nonsense. Oh, it was too silly. It was too silly. Yeah, it's not like a seal. <laughs> Science fiction had always been a dependable staple at Fox. One model I would find it a little difficult to understand is how you've got a ball and socket joint in uh, mm. our lovely lady there. Yes. This is a miniature model, of course, of Raquel Welsh, which we used in the film One Million Years B.C. And as you see, she has, uh, again, very small joints that will go in any direction and she will stay put in the same manner as the animals. And on the screen, when they're intercut and, and combined with uh, double printing processes, why, uh, uh, it's rather deceiving. You can't quite see where the real Raquel leaves off and the little miniature begins. I often wonder whether the attraction of Miss Welsh or the dinosaurs were the important thing in the picture. I think if cave women in the early days looked like Raquel Welsh while we've regressed considerably today. <laughs> it was a kind of genius of sorts to do all of these very, the special effects and this frame-by-frame -frame photography and it was all explained to me you know, in great detail. So I took on the project with the Hammer Company in London. One scene in uh, 1 million BC, the pterodactyl picks up Raquel Welsh. We have the real Raquel Welsh falling into a hole dug in the ground behind a rock. And then as the pterodactyl goes down, we substitute a little miniature figure uh, that is animated as the bird flies away with her. So that gave the impression that the bird actually picked up the real Raquel Wilkes. This is one example of uh, a pterodactyl that picked up Raquel Welsh. That was one of the first scenes I did in the picture to put together after we photographed the live action. And as you see, this model moves. It has every joint that a, a real bird of this nature would have. Pterodactyl is very flexible. As you can see, the wings move. It can collapse its wing. It flaps them in the normal manner of a bird, and its head will move. This beak will close. So it has to have every joint that a real bird of this nature would have. I give it bat wings to make it look airborne. If you don't, otherwise it's just a straight piece of leather and the bat wings give it uh, the effect that it's airborne. Primitive man and monstrous beasts fought each other to inherit the earth. 
People don't realize that when you have this kind of budget going, you simply have to shoot. John Taffy was the director, did a really, really very good job of the movie for that time. And Ray Harryhausen was doing all the special effects. Harryhausen was this genius in that area of, of, of special effects. <laughs> So I could see the sort of appeal of, of that kind of film, but um, it took me years to live it down. See the fascinating, strange, and fearful creatures who roamed and ruled the earth a million years B.C. The Brontosaurus, a moving mountain of flesh and bone. It was a pleasure to get back to dinosaurs again. They were my first love. The man was a genius. The flesh-eating Allosaurus. A frightening thing, of course, is that when you're looking at the rushes after a full day's work, you go into the theatre the next day, you've got six frames. You know, I mean, it's better to hold them up to the light, because otherwise they've gone through so quickly. John Richardson has Tumac, as big and strong as the beasts he fought for survival. <laughs> Triceratops, a horned dinosaur in battle with the savage Ceratosaurus. You will share the unending thrills and excitement of a world of primitive wonders, of primeval terror and savagery. You will indeed live in another world, in another time, as the centuries fall back to reveal the Earth one million years BC. And then you have this big girl fight in the middle. Everyone who's seen One Million Years B.C. remembers the grunting. Queen of the Shell people and the Queen of the Rock people had to have a girl fight. And we had to do Destry rides again in the caves of Tenerife. Oh, yes. oh. oh that was uh, the girl fight, you know, the famous girl fight. I always liked to do those kind of things because my training was in dancing. I knew how to move and I felt like I was doing something instead of just walking around in some little scanty outfit all the time. So I, I used to enjoy that very much. And the, and the fight scene did come off pretty well, I thought, in the end. The whole thing was kind of like a dance. Martine and I worked out this whole routine together. I just loved to do the action stuff. I should have been a boy. <laughs> That was a big deal. She's a very nice girl. We got along great and a very beautiful girl. And um, she was the baddie and I was, I was the good girl. I was queen of the shell people or something like that if you wanted to put it in really <laughs> kitsch terms. Nupondi the wild one whom no man could resist. Jamaican-born Martine Beswick writhed her way through her portrayal of the naughty Neanderthal. What was happening was that Raquel had this lovely, everything was like perfect, and mine looked like a rag, you know, so I was a bit jealous. <laughs> so, she had more makeup and she had eyelashes, and I had to go like a pig woman. I want to ask you, someone, yes. we never talked about Raquel Welsh, because this oh, was yes. an unusual thing, actually, for her to get someone who was then, she was a big star. And they said, no, but we can't have it because of the insurance, and, you know, if you get hurt, and... We were, but we both were dancers, we can do this. We were, we, we love to dance, both of us. And so they brought in someone, and they choreographed it, and we turned out a really good fight. <laughs> there was a big contract, and it was a, basically a sort of a loan out between Hammer, and this America thing, mm -hmm. and this was going to be her coming out. She was, I kind of felt a bit, at first she was sort of like just, you know, not, not wouldn't have anything to do with anybody, but I realized she was sort of last of the studio. Mm -hmm. The American Hollywood studio yes, system. Yes. The Hollywood system, and, and she was very much under their thumb. There was a part of her that was like really like why and you know just like angry about it. But so I kind of had a, a bit of a heart thing and I felt for her. Mm -hmm. But she wasn't she wasn't a happy she wasn't a happy bunny. She was not a happy bunny about it. 
Um, but she was perfect. <laughs> Nothing. I, I didn't have any say. Nothing. No, no, you know, people really do think, well, they've chosen such bad pro projects. And you think, yeah, but if I was Meryl Streep, I could choose my projects. Mm. But if I'm Raquel Welch and breaking into Hollywood and I, you know, end up in a dinosaur movie, I mean, I'm not choosing my projects. You know, these are things that are assigned to me. But, um, but you're so talented. I just was completely thrown. I had this idea that I was going to be this serious, dramatic actress, and that just was not in the cards. She really wanted to change that. And was desperate for people to look beyond the bikini. I have the impression from talking to Raquel that she thought she was going to be doing Chekhov and Strindberg and stuff like that. I think she really wanted to be taken seriously. But at the same time, it was like, you know, this isn't me but this is what I have to do because this is my ticket to ride. Mm -hmm. And I'm not in a position to just say, oh, no, wait a minute, you got it all wrong. I'd like to do Shakespeare. I'd like to do something really serious. Yeah. But it was the publicity shot for the film that turned Raquel from an unknown into a superstar. When people saw that poster, that was it. She exploded through the paper. <laughs> But hello, Raquel Welch, looking totally sauvage in this ripped leather bikini. I'm a gay man, and even I got it. In 1966, the cave girl image from one million years BC seared itself onto the American psyche. And pretty soon, what do you know? Suddenly, after all those years, I was an overnight success. <laughs> In 1966, a poster of her in a fur bikini hung in almost every teenage boy's room. Raquel Welch was a pinup phenomenon. Here in Hollywood, where image is everything, Raquel's stunning image made her a sensation at age 24. She hailed from just down the coast in San Diego, but she was considered by some as a goddess descended from Mount Olympus. This particular photo launched her into international stardom. One of the most famous images in movie history. Do you remember the, the day these pictures were taken? Well, I was on a, top of a volcano. While they were shooting all the scenes, there was this guy, a uh, unit photographer with a motor on his camera, and he was just sh -sh 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 shooting everybody because we didn't hardly have a di any dialogue anyway. Well, somebody, I, I guess it was a unit photographer, shot this picture of me there, right? out there in this lava desert with the sort of smoke bombs coming up and just caught me in that position where I sort of turned. My whole life had changed because of this picture. Apparently it had gone out and around and was the subject of a Christmas card for Hammer Films. And I was just, you know, overnight, everybody knew who I was and I became a star. And uh, but unfortunately, not just a star, I became a sex symbol. And part of me loved it, thought it was the greatest thing ever, and part of me went, oh, gosh, I'm not sure I like this. Living up to the fantasy would not be easy. I was excited. I don't mean to say I wasn't. I was, I was two things at once, but somehow the sort of sheer terror of it was, was almost more painful than being happy about it. You know, I was just scared all the time. I'm trying to be a serious actress, but I'm no sex symbol. And from 1 million BC and on, they were just saying, oh, you know, she's yeah. just a, a gorgeous face, no, and men are salivating over her, and it's ridiculous. She's got no brains, and she's got no talent, and she's not going to last, and... Uh, we run and, this video in a oh. loop, just so you know. <laughs> but uh, what do you make of that? And then they just sort of d dismiss you. Well, you know, I, I came along in the 60s when I was caught between the um, hardline feminists and the um, hippies and the, you know, right. the flower children. And so between the drugs and the rock and roll and the feminists, you know, there was no place for me to land. <laughs> Finally, we wrap the show, the whole show, and we go back to London because it was a British production. And I get off the plane there. And but by the time she returned to London from the shoot, the whole world had already heard. I hit Heathrow Airport, and somehow one of those many pictures that was shot of me in this doe skin bikini. And these photographers are everywhere, and they're yelling my name. I thought, wow, really? They all know who I am? And, and all because I came here and did this crazy dinosaur movie? <laughs> and it was a costume. It was the costume. It's just wham, bam, and whoa. People were making a big fuss over these shots of me, got off the plane, and 
there was like paparazzi, like wall to wall, you know, like Raquel, Raquel, Raquel. I was like, but they know who I am. And then suddenly, you know, there I was. I had got off the plane in London, and I suddenly everybody knew who I was. I had no idea they were circulating this little production yeah. shot all over the planet. <laughs> I never thought that I'd, any of it would see the light of day. I never saw these pictures until after I came back to, to Heathrow Airport. When you go back to Britain, it was like a, a, an explosion. Your life was never going to be the same again. I never had that kind of reception before. There were tons of paparazzi and photo photographers everywhere. Raquel, Raquel, Raquel. I said, oh my God, they know who I am. How do they know who I am? And there they all knew. Did you love it? I did. It must be I did. I said, moment, uh, I thought, oh my gosh, isn't this funny? I thought this was going to be one of those movies that was going to just make me a laughing stock. Well, it did that too. <laughs> but <laughs> and it's 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 a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough for me. Every single person seems to know who I am. And wasn't that your very first big uh, a reaction or feeling of what it was like to be in the spotlight? Yes, and it was, it was shocking to me because I didn't know that, that it was happening uh -huh. because I had been away on this volcanic mountain in Tenerife, actually, which is, you, you know, it's in the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. It's just, you know, the most remote Isolated. place mm -hmm. you could possibly be. And, and some production shot that they got of me while I was making this movie. You didn't know they were taking that picture? Well, I knew they were taking a picture, right. but I never saw the pictures. Right. So then I get off the plane coming back into Heathrow in, in London, and uh, everybody was like, Raquel, 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 you know. Wow. Raquel. And I was going, how do they know my name? I, what is happening wow. here? And I was going, what, what? And they were going, yeah, yeah. And pretty soon I realized the whole thing had happened because of this one single uh, photograph. Extraordinary picture. Yeah, yeah, but you know what's strange about that is it is a picture. It's just an inanimate object. It's a, a split second of your life. Exactly. Right. What actually happened when that image started being circulated around the globe. Well, you know, for some reason, sex sells. I yes. You know that. <laughs> yes. And so then there's this sort of barrage of attention, you know, photographs and more photographs and, and, and just, you know, celebrating you for things that you really don't feel worthy of. And it's not a representation of you. 26-year-old Raquel Welch ignited the world's fantasies with an image of female power as explosive as the 1960s themselves. Raquel Welch was highly sexual, highly intelligent, but kind of Amazonian. The great poster image of Raquel from a million years BC seems to me one of the supreme images of women of the 20th century, because what it represents is primeval woman. You know, she's showing it all, and she's primal. She definitely gave Tarzan a run for his money. She is just amazing looking, isn't she? A million years before Christ, women look like that? What have we done? Our nutrition, our fitness, it's all wrong. After the movie came out, there was no turning back for Raquel. The poster shot started to come out, and I became this overnight international sex symbol. Not many people remember that film, but pretty much everyone knows that image of her on the poster. Wherever I go, people come up to me, even now, and say, my father has your poster. So it's like, still out there after all these years. Photos that I signed. Like oh, autographs, like, well, you, know, you know. Sometimes the, the, the cave girl keeps coming across there, you know, with her big, you know, sort of whatever that thing is, is that stance she has, it's very strong, you know, can yeah. you handle me type uh, woman pose. And uh, yeah, that's the one I sign the most, that's the one that they send the most in. Do you know that poster of you in the bikini? Yes. That you signed for me? Yes. It's still hanging up in the green room here, did you oh, know that? Yeah. No, I didn't see it, oh great. And you know when you signed the mirror in my dressing room? Yes. And when you were here last? Yes. It's still there, I won't let them clean it oh, off. Oh, isn't that sweet? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. But that is not the behavior of a married man. Well, you weren't, I was married when you signed the thing oh. on the third. Right? <laughs> From the very beginning, off of one photograph, please, one photograph, she was a famous, famous person. I do think that there are images, both uh, in film and still, that have that kind of magic impact on us. And it freezes a particular moment, a magic moment, that are a part of our pop culture history and have had just a tremendous impact on us and a tremendous impact on the people at the time. Uh, and it runs the gamut from Betty Grable's pinup to the Quell Welsh uh, poster. I never thought in a million years I would be 
considered a sex symbol. But that did come, and there it was. And I gotta tell you, I was so lucky. The poster for this became truly iconic and was on maybe six million, maybe six million and forty dorm room walls. From page 23 of your book, you write, several million copies of that image were circulated throughout the planet. And by that we mean that doe skin bikini struck a chord. I became every male's fantasy from that film. It has been nearly 40 years since the girl in the fur bikini took Hollywood by storm. And Best selling pinup poster. A photo of her in a prehistoric bikini became one of the best-selling posters of all time. Okay, I admit, I was one of the millions of guys who had a crush on her when I was a young guy, all right? Millions of fans remember this Raquel, a cave woman never looked so good. Still one of the most strikingly beautiful women around. Her beauty is timeless. And so is her message. When she posed as a cave girl for what became the biggest selling poster up to its time. As someone said, the reason man walks upright. Why that image? And why you? That one image of me with the arms sort of akimbo and the legs spread apart, that's not a pinup girl that you saw any time before that. And I didn't want to just be a schlub in a doe skin bikini. And that photograph sort of caught the essence of that rather formidable new woman. Of course, I had a lot of time to think about it. For the posters, they were getting off on this, <laughs> you know, image of this woman, you know, with this legs akimbo kind of thing, like very... Still one of the most amazing photographs of anyone in a bikini I've ever seen, ever. I see it and I go, wow. Um, and of course, anybody who's seen Shawshank Redemption has seen um, this poster got exposed to a whole new generation of fans <laughs> on the wall in that cell. Tell me very quickly about this poster. It was the, the shot that was taken on production and disseminated through millions of, of people all over the world, all over the planet. And uh, it made me into an instant star. And um, that was a good thing. But um, Frank Darabon did call me personally and ask if he could use this uh, poster in the picture. And I read the, the script part, which showed how it was going to be used. And I was very, very flattered, you know, to be in the company of, of Rita Hayworth and Marilyn Monroe and be the one to represent the 60s. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> that poster wasn't all bad. No, you represented well. It was lovely Raquel. Let's ask her. Maybe she knows. What say there, fussy britches? The famous poster of her in the fur bikini from One Million Years B.C., super hot. I think that for most women, with the exception of Meryl Streep and a few of her ilk, uh, for most women in, in my business, uh, physical attractiveness is, is part, of the, part of the kit. <laughs> and so I don't want to complain because I did, you know, have such a flattering image in lots of ways. But I think that, that it's an old and almost cliched story now that... that when you are objectified in any way, it's only such a small, you know, tip of the iceberg. You know, people who seem to have like a one-dimensional, uh, bigger-than-life kind of a persona, and then suddenly, wow, the real person is nothing whatever like the packaging. There's more so, here than meets the eye. Something like that. Raquel's exotic beauty was undeniable. Still, her unique appeal was a far cry from the blonde bombshells of the 1950s. One of the world's sexiest women. In the late 60s, after the success of One Million Years B.C., Raquel was the hottest thing in Hollywood. After that film came out, Raquel Welsh was known across the world and she was in massive demand. I do think that... Without it, I would never have the other opportunities that I've had. Her string of successes kept coming. A huge blockbuster. It's difficult um, to follow it. 